Welcome to the third, the second part of this lecture, but which is actually the last part uh, of this course where we introduce some new topics um, because the last part will only be a summary of the whole course. We will talk about product line maintenance. Uh, we will talk, uh, we will do have a, a small recap. What is maintenance? What is software maintenance? And we will see some examples uh, how this looks like for product lines. So first of all, what is the motivation for maintenance? Because for software, there's no compensation of deterioration. Uh, there's no repair necessary in a sense that something gets broken and we need to fix it. We don't need to, we don't have parts that just break and then we need to replace them. Uh, so there are no spare parts. So why do we have maintenance at all? We do have corrections, especially shortly after delivery, especially if we have some new products, if we have some larger changes, and we see this in many areas, for instance, in operating system, if there's a new version of the operating system, there are many corrections happening afterwards, or if there's a new car produced, then we will have uh, a couple of iterations where, new, uh, where further corrections are done afterwards. And part of this also happens during modification or reconstruction, because in order to maintain software, in order to make uh, software work all the time, sometimes we need to restructure, we need to make changes, even though there were no faults, no problems in the original software. So there's two definitions here. Uh, one's uh, about the operations and maintenance phase. The period of time in software uh, lifecycle during which a software product is, is employed in its operational environment, monitored for satisfactory performance and modified as necessary to correct problems or respond to changing requirements. So we see that there are a couple of tasks actually in this operating, operation and maintenance phase, which is happens to be the last phase during the waterfall model, but also something that is incorporated uh, and known as the operations. So a more uh, uh, younger and more agile models, this is also known as DevOps, kind of the development and operations, they go hand in hand and operations is done by the same team as the development. Still, there are a couple of things that we need to do during the, uh, while the software is running and uh, being used by uh, users, by customers, even if it's indirectly uh, because of this uh, system software and not application software, uh, it still needs to be monitored. Uh, we need to see whether the performance gets worse uh, and uh, then we still need to adapt and correct problems and so on. But there are also uh, changing requirements. So, so there are some uh, yeah, problems that come from like a, a changed situation. And that's what brings us back again to uh, the quote from the first part of the lecture, uh, where we've seen that if software runs the world, then if something changes in the world, we might also need to change the software. And then maintenance, what is it? The process of modifying a software system or component after delivery to correct faults, improve performance or other attributes or adapt to a changed environment. So there are different reasons why we need to adapt a piece of software, but this all sounds very similar from the motivation to evolution. So what is the difference between evolution and maintenance? Evolution as discussed in the last part of the lecture is uh, more or less like we are adding or removing some functionality. We've seen from the Linux kernel that there are more and more features, more and more lines of code. So most of the time we're just adding functionality, but there's also cases where we remove some. Uh, we do have larger changes uh, during evolution than uh, in maintenance. We often have foreseen changes. So we are planning this. Uh, we do see that in the future there's a uh, new architecture. We are preparing this already that uh, we will later on support the new uh, computer architecture also in the operating system. So the evolution typically results in upgrades, service packs, cumulative updates. 
you can uh, consider like things like a new version of an operating system, uh, a new major version, for instance, uh, would be such an example, like the uh, switch from Windows, uh, Windows 10 to Windows 11, for instance. So what we do have are major minor releases. So going from version 10 to 11 for Windows would be a major release, but there are also minor releases. For instance, these releases that happen uh, once in a month uh, for Microsoft products. And then we have maintenance on the other side, where we have mostly, we're mostly looking at corrections. There are other reasons for maintenance, but most of the time we are uh, working on corrections when it comes to maintenance. We often have smaller changes. Um, so if you consider that there's a break in the system and it needs to be up and running uh, as fast as possible again, then you don't want to rewrite the whole software, but you only want a small fix that uh, makes the software work again. Often these are unforeseen changes, for instance, for corrections, because if we would foresee those problems, then, uh, I mean, in particular, those problems, then we, uh, there would be no need for these corrections later on. Uh, of course, sometimes we also are aware of some problems. Uh, I've heard this, that, uh, for instance, uh, uh, for the Windows operating system, uh, that they, uh, they decide on purpose to not fix certain of the problems because it's uh, it has a low priority because there are other things that are more on a higher priority but also making this change has a higher risk of introducing new problems so it it can be uh, that even some things are kind of uh, foreseen or we already know that some problems uh, exist when we release software and it typically results, maintenance typically results in patches and hot fixes. So a patch release is typically reflected by means of semantic versioning, by means of the version number, which is the patch version. Uh, so only the last digit uh, will uh, change over here if it's a patch release. Still, even though it like this classification and all these differences might help us, still there's no clear boundary between both. It's not always easy to distinguish. Is it evolution or is it maintenance? Is it really foreseen or unforeseen? Uh, if in the last spint uh, of Scrum, uh, I already knew that I would do this uh, change uh, in the next spin. Uh, is it then foreseen or not foreseen? So this is not hard to, uh, not uh, easy to distinguish, and rather it's a continuum between evolution and maintenance. And this uh, lecture file is even called uh, evonance in order to reflect this that this is there's actually a larger continuum, and wh wh whenever we do some changes to the software, we are somewhere in this continuum, and sometimes it's more closely to evolution, sometimes more to maintenance, and sometimes it's not easy to distinguish. Still, we have some distinction of different kinds of maintenance activities that we see, and uh, I'm teaching this uh, already in my software engineering course, but I want to apply it now to uh, some examples also from uh, that could uh, uh, be happen for product lines. So over here we have adaptive maintenance, software maintenance performed to make a computer program usable in a changed environment. So we could say, let's assume we have a product line of certain desktop applications, for instance, a chat client or a database, and this database or chat client runs on Windows 10. And now we have this, we've had the switch to Windows 11, and we want to make it work again on the new operating system. And in order to make this, there's a changed environment and some things might need to be changed, uh, either uh, to have the, the right appearance or also about uh, actual uh, functionality. Then we have corrective maintenance. Maintenance performed to correct faults in software. So we've seen examples of this, uh, plenty of examples of software faults, but for instance, we looked at the Lenovo um, compatibility matrices in lecture nine. And in this lecture, we, we've we seen that there are certain uh, notebooks and there's certain accessories that I can buy uh, together to be used together with the notebook. And these certain combinations are problematic. And sometimes these can be fixed by means of 
changing the software, for instance, changing the BIOS. Uh, so sometimes the BIOS update helps and we've seen, uh, seen examples of this uh, in earlier slides. Then we have perfective maintenance, software maintenance performed to improve the performance, maintainability or other attributes of a computer program. Uh, for instance, we want to improve the startup time of the Linux kernel, right? So that's maybe the only purpose, right? So we've identified that it was going slower, the Linux kernel is getting more complex and maybe under some, only some uh, configurations we do have this problem and we want to improve the startup time, then this is perfective maintenance. Um, another change related to perfective maintenance is that in, for the Linux kernel development, there was um, a, a new guideline uh, released uh, something about uh, 10 years ago, where they, uh, they said that we don't want to have this fine-grained variability anymore. We, we only want to have variability, if possible, um, only in header files. So whenever we change existing implementations to only have variability in header files, this would be, could be considered as perfective maintenance. So we are improving the maintainability of the software product line by means of like transferring by uh, rewriting the source code to make it more readable. And then we have preventive maintenance, maintenance performed for the purpose of preventing problems before they occur. And for instance, um, uh, one of the like uh, famous examples in terms of preventive maintenance is uh, that of leap seconds. So there was no leap second uh, since uh, uh, December 31st uh, in 2016. Uh, so when the next leap second will be, uh, there will be many software systems that will have problems with leap seconds. Um, so we could, for instance, say that there's a code audit of car software. So whenever the, the next leap second is announced, uh, we will try to find uh, potential problems due to the leap second uh, in order to avoid crashes of cars or, or other dysfunctionality. We've already seen something that uh, is considered maintenance. Um, uh, in previous slides, uh, but we haven't uh, talked about this uh, that explicitly. Um, for instance, if we look at feature models. So we looked at feature models, we've seen how we can analyze these feature models, and we've seen that we can automatically translate a feature model into a formula, we can automatically translate it into conjunctive normal form, and then we can use, for instance, the Dimex format and pass it to a set solver to make some computations. So this is automatic. What is not automatic to go the other way around, to go, for instance, from a configuration map to a feature model, or to go from natural language requirements, for instance, to a feature model. It's not that easy how to do this, and this is uh, something special which we could also consider as maintenance whenever we want to improve a system that doesn't have a feature model or make this explicit. We want to introduce a feature model for that system in order to improve the maintenance, the future maintenance, and uh, we consider whatever artifacts are available. For instance, we could consider a program with one-time variability and we want to transfer this into a product line with a feature model, then we want to understand, we want let the program run for the, under different configurations and we'll see which configurations actually work and then we come back to the feature model and create a feature model. And the question is, how is this called? And um, we've seen uh, two citations, so if you are interested in this, how this it uh, works in detail, you can look over here. Uh, we will not uh, discuss this here uh, in detail during this lecture, um, but uh, rather go on a more abstract level on this topic. And this is known as re-engineering, and in particular, the use case of creating a feature model from existing configuration is known as reverse engineering. Reverse engineering is the process of analyzing a system to identify the system's components and their interrelationships and create representation of the system in another form or at a higher level of abstraction. So actually the feature model contains more information 
uh, than just the valid com combinations because it also contains, some, for instance, some abstract features that are used for grouping. It contains some hierarchy. It uh, contains some uh, constraints that are much more readable than they are in conjunctive normal form, for instance. So we do have more information in the feature model. And if we want to kind of retrieve, go from like a more concrete representation to a more abstract one, this is known as reverse engineering. So kind of the opposite for reverse engineering is forward engineering. Forward engineering is a traditional process of moving from high level abstractions to logical implementation independent designs to the physical implementation of a system. So this is basically what we discussed in detail in lecture eight in the first part uh, when it comes to domain engineering. Because in domain engineering, we said we start with domain analysis where we create a feature model. Then we continue with domain analysis where we make uh, yeah, a decision on the architecture of a system of design patterns being used. And then we go further to the implementation of the domain. So this is forward engineering because we are going from a more abstract representation, actually from the problem space to the solution space, but also in the solution space from architecture to design to implementation. Uh, so this is what is known as forward engineering. And another example for classical software development would be the waterfall model. But there are other terms uh, and other things, uh, other tasks in re-engineering. And these tasks are, for instance, refactoring. So refactoring is a transformation from one form of representation to another at the same level of abstraction. The new representation is meant to preserve the semantics and external behavior of the original one. We've seen refactorings in the last part of uh, the first part of this lecture. Uh, we talked about feature model refactorings, right? So changes to the structure of the feature model but those changes are meant to be in a way that they do not change the set of available products. They are only applied to improve readability and maintainability of the feature model. But of course, we can also have refactorings on source code. Um, so for instance, if we uh, apply these changes that I mentioned uh, earlier in this, uh, this lecture, uh, that we want to apply and move some of the variability annotations to header files in the Linux kernel, then this could also be considered refactoring if overall we are not changing uh, the set of products, the set of generated products. And then there's another term, re-engineering. And re-engineering is the examination and alteration of the subject system to reconstitute it in a new form and uh, the subsequent implementation of the new form. So re-engineering is more complex. It often involves reverse engineering, refactoring, and forward engineering, or any combination uh, thereof. So it's like more uh, a more broader term. And that's why we also say these are all different re-engineering tasks. And sometimes we want to go forward from a more abstract to a more concrete level. Sometimes we want to go from a more concrete to a more abstract level. And sometimes we want to maintain the same level and apply a certain uh, yeah, refactorings, for instance, to change the structure, to change the inner structure, but maintain the semantics. So while well, these are all different examples, uh, we talked about maintenance. What is maintenance? We talked about re-engineering. And most of you have heard about maintenance and re-engineering probably already in, in um, uh, other uh, more basic courses and classes. And this was to remind you of what is maintenance, what is re-engineering, uh, what do we need to do in those phases, and what are examples for product lines. So why is it a problem also for product lines? So we need maintenance, we need re-engineering for any software. So we also need this for software product lines and what is special about those two uh, strategies. Uh, there's more reading over here and you could think uh, about the connection of previous lectures. So in previous lectures, in lecture eight, we talked about product line adoption strategies. So how to introduce a product line to um, a certain company or a certain team or whatever. And how do they uh, relate with re-engineering tasks? I kind of already gave a part of the answer in uh, this lecture, but not completely. So this is uh, something to connect the different topics 
in your mind uh, and in order to get a deeper understanding of the topic. Hope you enjoyed the lecture and hope to see you again uh, for the summary of the whole course. Bye.